We actually have 10 nominees for Best Picture this year, so it makes this video a lot better. Today, I'm going to rank all 10 movies. Let's do it. What is up, Flick fans? Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm looking at all of the Best Picture nominees for this year's Oscars, which is happening tomorrow, and I'm going to rank them in my personal order. This is not the order in which I think they're going to get the victory. We talked about that in yesterday's video, but today, I'm going to tell you which ones hit me the hardest on a personal level. Also, we have to talk about this weekend sponsorship, and that is Odds Checker. I'm sorry, I didn't do the thing. Sponsorship. Awesome. What is Odds Checker? How is it going to help me? Well, it's all about comparing odds from the best betting websites on the internet. And yes, that means sports and the Oscars. There are two things that I absolutely love about this site. It's telling you the websites that are going to give you the best bang for your buck when it comes to betting on the actual Oscars. It also gives you a great feel for the overall odds with this year's Oscars. I referenced it so many times in yesterday's predictions video. And what I did down below is I left links, examples of some articles you can check out if you're curious what has the best and worst chances of taking home an Oscar. And if you guys click those links, I promise, all you have to do is read the articles. It helps myself and Odds Checker out immensely. They were willing to sponsor the video. I appreciate them and I appreciate you all for following those links down below and supporting me. At a time when I really need your support, regardless, thanks again to Odds Checker for sponsoring this video. Starting out at the bottom of this list, uh, the movie that I, I feel like you're either on one side of the fence or the other. Well, I guess that's not technically the case for me, but we're talking Don't Look Up. Now, with this video, it's all personal, right? How every movie hit me, myself, and I individually. So, uh, everyone's points are going to vary. And I understand, even with my review, a lot of people were just truly upset that I didn't love this movie and think it was the greatest thing ever. But I didn't. And regardless of what people wanted to think at the time, my main reasoning for not loving this film was uh, the humor. That, for me, just didn't work as well as it needed to with this film. Now, understandably so, the counterpoint to that is, well, Austin, it's not supposed to be full comedy. There's a message. There are elements in there that, you know, come together. And I will completely agree with the praises for the third act of this movie. I think there are a lot of great things in there. The dinner table scene is awesome. Uh, the performance overall by Leonardo DiCaprio, especially when he loses it on set. There's so many things to love about this movie. But my main argument for just not loving it on the level that I wanted to was the fact that it tries so hard to be a comedy at points. Again, there's a message, and that's not my issue. It's the forced humor that's attempting to be satirical, but if you're going to be satirical, and if you're going to try to be funny every few minutes, and especially someone like Jonah Hill's character that's, you know, doing this subtle type sarcastic humor that you can point references to, I understand that, but it just didn't make me laugh. I, I was sitting there at times just kind of like, oh, I I'm not laughing. Why am I not laughing? I love Adam McKay. My other point is, comparing it to these other Best Picture nominees, especially this year, it just looks and feels cheaper in a way. It doesn't have that cinematic quality that maybe I expected from a film like this. You also have some editing choices that didn't quite work for me, and it's funny because it was nominated for Best Editing, and I'm like, oh, that's what you're going to do. Out of all the movies that came out this year, you're going to nominate that. All right, good, great job. I just didn't fully respond like I wanted to respond to this film. So many great elements, a great cast, a great director, didn't quite come together at the end of the day. So for me, it's like far and away at the bottom of this list, but I can understand why people have it near the top. Next up, here's where you're gonna start to see some changes on this list, and this is frustrating for me because this movie did move me. Like, I was emotionally moved in the theater, I thought it was very well filmed, but it didn't stick with me like some of these other nominees. And other nominees that I gave lower scores to, I, I felt them in here just a bit longer, which is crazy because, again, Belfast is one of those movies that has so much to it when it comes to the emotion of the film. I think Belfast is a really good movie. I do. But there is a lot to it when it comes to the character evolutions, the actual progression of the plot that wasn't entirely nailing it in every single act. I felt a bit of a lull in the middle of the movie. Now, eventually, it did pick up. I think all the story arcs are great. And the perspective of this young boy, Jude Hill's character. Jude Hill, by the way, is fantastic in this movie. I mean, truly awesome. Uh, so... 
seeing everything from the perspective of his character and getting those moments with his grandparents, uh, getting those moments with his father, uh, the back and forth was beautiful. But there was something about the package in its entirety that didn't feel like it resonated with me as much as it needed to. And the pacing is also something with this film. Like, we went and watched it with two friends who kind of fell asleep in the theater, and it was late, and I disagreed that it was a movie warranting falling asleep in, but I guess I could see in a way. Look, I think Kenneth Branagh does a nice job with this film. It's really well directed, a nice script. Overall, uh, it's a good movie, but it does fall lower on this specific list. Next up, Bradley Cooper is a carny. Uh, this movie's fascinating because it's distinctly separated into two very different portions. At the beginning, when Cooper's character is going on this journey and kind of discovering who and what he wants to be, and then the second half of Nightmare Alley, when everything really starts to come together, Kate Blanchett enters the picture, and anytime she does that in any movie, it's going to pick up in an interesting way. Now, I was a bit different than some people, though, because I thought the first half was more put together than the second half, but the second half is way more entertaining. A couple of aspects to this movie that make it even more fascinating when you think about it and how it comes together as a whole, and that's probably my biggest nitpick with the film is it doesn't quite mesh as well as it wants to. It does feel like two very distinct and different storylines. But when I go back and I revisit all of these things in my head, like the production design and certain interactions between characters, and then his character arc, and that final haunting, crazy shot in the movie that, to this day, I will say is one of Del Toro's best endings ever. It just works out in the exact way it needs to. I have to say Nightmare Alley resonated with me a lot more than I expected it to. It really did. It stuck with me uh, for weeks after watching, and I did feel like I, I wanted to bump up that score just a little bit. Now, did I? You can check my thoughts out on Letterboxd, but it, it did move slightly on my list. Next up, let's get this out of the way. We're talking Licorice Pizza, a movie that I, I really did. I just admired the technique, the craft, and the filmmaking behind it the first time that I watched it, and Paul Thomas Anderson, what he's able to do with his characters and just, you know, building those relationships, sometimes tearing down those relationships, and those really quirky and humorous, humor-filled moments. Alana Haim is amazing in this movie. All of that being said, you're probably recognizing that this is a, a bit lower down than you expected it to be. I did see some criticisms pointed out online that I, I'm not going to say I entirely agree with, but those criticisms did kind of stick with me in a way that made me want to go back and revisit this movie and, and almost approach it in a different way. And approaching it in that way didn't tear down what I loved about it in the first place. But I did look at a few elements of this movie and say... I don't know if that's the approach that I would have taken, and I don't know if the elements about this relationship, people saying with, if the roles were reversed and all of that, and I'm not the type of person that normally, look, art is not something that I have to agree with to appreciate. I, I think that's the main argument here for enjoying Licorice Pizza. If you go back through Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography, every single movie that he has directed holds something along the lines of, well, it's obviously not meant to be morally correct. That's just the way that it is, right? But the themes of this film are also so prevalent throughout that you have to gravitate towards it just a little bit to respond to this movie in the way that a lot of people have. And again, the craft is so great, and I just appreciate so many elements. It is a beautiful-looking film. But those elements that I was just talking about, well, they didn't necessarily stick with me as well, and, and they didn't work as well for me the second time, which is why I, I bumped Licorice Pizza down just a notch or two. That doesn't mean I think it's a bad movie. I know a lot of people think that, but again, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I think something has to be of the highest moral standard to be considered good. Art is art, but sometimes you have to uh, be able to emotionally attach yourself to certain things to appreciate them more, and I, I do appreciate a lot of people for feeding their thoughts on this film and just allowing for a discussion. Lots of arguments. Keep that nonsense. Put, the, put that somewhere else. But the discussions were what I, I was more focused on, and I appreciate that. Next up, Drive My Car. It's taken me so long to figure out how to feel about this movie, and even after two, <laughs> two whole watches, I'm still not entirely sure if I can, can grasp 
the entire film. And that's not me saying, well, it's a three-hour movie. It takes me four watches just to appreciate it. That's, that's not the case, and that really... It normally isn't the case with the film, but Drive My Car, it's different. It's a different experience. It's it's almost at times like this euphoric experience that you just don't know how to feel about. I mean, it takes, what, 40-something minutes to open the movie, right? <laughs> Anytime there's a choice like that, you're like, well, I know I'm in for something different. That's for sure. And Drive My Car is different. What I felt while watching this film, you know, a lot of it comes down to your experience with grief and how you're able to relate to the movie from that perspective. Losing someone can clearly be challenging and all comes down to how our characters handle that. Now, is the film able to narratively construct that in the most compelling way all throughout the movie? It's a three-hour runtime, right? I did feel the film drag, and that's why I wanted to watch it again. I wanted to give it a fair shake. I wanted to give it the opportunity to impress me the second time with its narrative, as opposed to the pacing ever so slightly getting in its way, because I believe it does, and I think it did that the second time as well, uh, but I did appreciate the story a lot more, and I was able to kind of comprehend what the filmmaker is going for, and just a movie that's so meticulously constructed, it's hard not to admire it, it's hard not to admire what the themes and the messages are here, compelling characters, beautiful movie to look at, and watching it, I'm like, yeah, I can understand <laughs> I can understand why I got a Best Picture nomination. I really can. So, uh, yeah, Drive My Car is an interesting one, and who knows, my thoughts may change again on a third watch, but as of now, I think this is a good spot. While my biggest issue with the power of the dog, the pacing, and oh, he doesn't, he doesn't like the pacing, so clearly he doesn't understand the mastery of this movie. It's all preferential. This is my personal list. Let me... Let me do it. It's slow. But that's sometimes not the worst thing. Especially when you have characters this compelling. A story and one very specific relationship that culminates at the end of the film to where it can be left up to interpretation the route that it goes. And that comes down to Cody Smith McPhee's character, his intentions. Uh, I don't want to dive too deep into that. But man, oh man, like... If that didn't hit me so much harder the second time around, I'm like, wow, I, I I understand now why people are really thinking about this movie weeks after they watch it for the first time. It did stick with me more the second time I watched it. That was one of the issues I had the first time watching. I'm like, it just didn't stick with me like other people said it would. Now, it did stick with me after watching it the second time. Uh, I had a great conversation uh, with a friend named Jacob about kind of the interpretation of the ending of the movie, posing questions to each other, and that kind of sparked a little bit in my brain, like, oh, okay, right? Now, do I still have issues with the pacing? Yes. It's not that I can't appreciate a slower burn type of movie, a slower burn type of Western, but that build-up, man, it, it doesn't quite build up in a way that gets me invested immediately. It is a slow burn, the definition of a slow burn Western, and I think that's a lot of people's issues as they're going into it expecting, oh, it's Benedict Cumberbatch, it's Jesse Plemons, it's going to be a, a rootin' tootin' shootout. No. No. But Campion's direction, the writing, the cinematography, the production design, all of these beautiful technical aspects that come together to create a best picture type of experience, they do come together, and they do create that at points. I'm not going to say I was entirely invested from start to finish, but it is definitely a fascinating character study, and that's why it did end up moving up in my brain uh, just a little bit at the end of the day. Is it my choice for Best Picture? No. Will I be devastated if it wins? I won't be devastated, but there are definitely some movies I'm rooting for harder. But Austin King Richard, man, it's a, it's a crowd place. You're going to put the fun, feel-good movie over the power of the dog? I am, because... You know, personal taste, right? I am a huge sports movie guy. Like, give me a good sports movie. I can sit and watch that. Not necessarily analyze it as close as I would something like The Power of the Dog, uh, but I'm going to enjoy it more. It's going to hit me harder in the emotions if it's well-constructed, well-made, and I think King Richard is all of those things. I expected this to be a crowd-pleasing movie, but what I didn't expect were those layers of emotions that our director um, was able to pull out of the film through, I mean, and almost solely through these performances. It was pretty phenomenal. And Will Smith, while he is clearly the hero, uh, he's in the title, right? It's not 
all about him. Anjanu Ellis, and I love that Smith said this during his CCA acceptance speech, Anjanu Ellis was a big reason why this movie worked, right? That relationship, that mother-father, you know, we're going to do everything we can for these girls, but sometimes we have to let them decide on their own time. The fact that it's a true story, right? Pushing these two girls who, of their sport, are like the two Michael Jordans, like they're the goats, in a sense. Uh, but he believed in them from the start, and I, I love that. He was, you know, somewhat overly aggressive at times. His techniques weren't responded to in the best of ways all throughout the movie, but you can tell he cares. You can tell he loves them, and I just, I love what they were able to bring out of that, man. I, I know it seems like a simple movie on its surface, but there's so much to it that makes this work, and to make this as compelling as it was, to get it a Best Picture nomination, it had to be well-constructed. It just did. I thought it was. I responded to it fairly heavily, and I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Oh, uh, West Side Story? Yeah, okay, let's do it. Listen, Steven Spielberg brought us a phenomenal musical. The The only real downside I have to this film, well, a couple of things. I, I did believe the scenes that were heavily focusing on Ansel Elgort, they didn't work quite as well. I just... I felt a little bit of stiffness from that performance. I needed some someone just a bit more compelling because all around him, you have Rachel Zegler and Rita Marino, Ariana DeBose, David Alvarez, uh, even Corey Stoll is good in this movie. Mike Face, like the cast is so freaking good. They're so freaking compelling. This movie is significantly better than I thought it was going to be. I was looking forward to it, but when you get a surprise on that level and, you know, the plot itself, you know what the plot, you know what the story is going to be because the original, for me, I appreciate this movie on a technical level maybe more than any other movie on this list. And yes, that includes Dune. The cinematography, everything about it is perfection. These sequences and making it feel so time appropriate with the costumes and the colors and the backgrounds, the productions, the sets, man. This is one of the coolest looking movies I've seen in years. It's easily the best looking musical I've seen in years. It's phenomenally produced. The choreography and some of these camera tricks and techniques. I, I was watching one of the musical numbers and just the effort that went into making this work so well and the, the mastery behind the camera movements, man. It's, it's incredible what they were able to do and Steven Spielberg just crushed this behind the camera. Again, maybe one or two decisions within the actual story at the end. I'm like, ah, if I was that character, I would have made this decision. So I couldn't entirely get behind those motivations. Uh, but for the most part, the story was super compelling. The relationships, everything about it. I like this West Side Story better than the first. Look, it's it, it's for some reason getting backlash. Like I never imagined a movie like Coda would get backlash. Actually, why did I not imagine that? It's the internet. It doesn't like as soon as Spider Man. Hit VOD. It's like, well, it's Disney, Disney. Oh, you cheap bastards! Oh, you cheap. That that shot. That specific shot looks like it's in front of a green screen. I've been holding onto this screen, this screen cap for six months, just waiting for this to hit VOD so I can send this tweet and. Cause chaos. <laughs> and now there's backlash for Coda because I don't know, it's too sweet. Uh, regardless, I'm just going to focus on my thoughts. Look, I think this movie's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. It was great the first time, but like some other movies on this list, the more I watched it, the more I was compelled by this film and just the intentions behind it. And I'm not going to sit here and say it's the best cinematography. I'm not going to sit here and say on a technical level, it's the best one. It's not. But for some reason, it's this story that hits me the hardest out of all 10. It's the story that is so meticulous and wonderful when it comes to the relationship between Ruby and her brother and her parents that when it starts to change throughout the film and you can see this passion grow stronger and you can begin to understand that she's going to pursue this no matter what, right? We've all been there. We, we've all been in her shoes um, in different ways, obviously, but to have the confidence to pursue that passion, 
But circumstantially, right, her parents and her brother being deaf, this is a very difficult thing for them to accept that she wants to be a singer. And as simple as that sounds, as simple as that story is, a little Sundance movie that earlier in the year I, I, I enjoyed, but I never imagined that film going this far and having a shot. I think that's as incredible of a story as the story itself is. It's just really cool to see. And I think the movie's wonderful. And I get that feeling watching Coda. And, you know, people are making the Green Book comparisons. Well, it's the feel good. That's fine. They, they can make those comparisons. It hit me personally on a personal level. And I understand why people feel the way that they do. And I appreciate that. I, I just believe it's wonderful. And it made my wife cry. And that's a hard thing to do. Heart of Stone. Hope she doesn't watch this. But number one, and I don't need to talk about this very long. You know how I feel. I walked by Denis Villeneuve at the Critics' Choice Awards, and I just wanted to reach out and touch his coat. But I didn't, because there was a scary security guard next to him, and he probably would have broken my arm. But I just wanted to, just wanted to reach out. It was weird. It was a weird experience for me, and for him, probably. I just love Villeneuve, man. I, I love his brain. I love how his brain operates. Watching that behind-the-scenes video uh, creating the sound effects for Dune, walking around on Rice Krispies. I said it yesterday. Any movie that utilizes Rice Krispies should win an Oscar. Or six. I think it wins six. Look, it's a slower film. It absolutely is. It's a slow-burn sci-fi movie that makes you sit and ponder the circumstances of life. That's fine. I believe that at its core is what Dune is, is what Dune is meant to be. But Dune for that movie was me. And I appreciated it even more so when I watched it again and just looked at how meticulously crafted it actually was and how they're setting up bigger things to come. Now, I will still stick with my biggest criticism of the movie. I think it ends in the wrong place. I think it could have ended a bit sooner and felt more like it earned that ending. Or I think it could have went just a couple of minutes longer. But, but that, for me, it's sooner, right? For me, it's you end off at that moment before we approach. And I, I guess I understand before we approach Zendaya and her people. Like, if they would have done that, I feel like that would have helped my personal experience because I, I just felt like it went on into part two before we actually got to part two. Regardless, the journey itself and how he gets there, how Paul Atreides, you know, is slowly turning into what that prophecy... What is that noise? Is slowly becoming what the prophecy says he will become. And to be a little past that in the book and, and know where this is heading, man, I'm just like... I'm pumped out of my mind to get to part two. Like, I'm really excited for part two. And I think part two, when people see that, they can appreciate part one even more so. So it really doesn't have a chance at best picture, but... Part two could be like a Return of the King situation where it's like, all right, we're finally going to get it to that level, but it has to deliver like part one did, but on a technical level. And you know where we're going with this. It's incredible to look at the visual effects, the cinematography. It's going to win a lot of those awards on Sunday. It's going to win a lot of those awards on Sunday, but I really appreciated Dune for what it was. It's at the top of this list. I know it really doesn't have a shot at Best Picture, but personally, this is where we are with my top 10. I feel like I just talked for six seconds. This is a long video. I apologize. But hey, if you're still here, I want to say thank you to the sponsor of this video, Odds Checker. All of the articles that are going to help you all with the odds for this year's categories are down below. Those links, they're in the description. They're in the comments, man. If you want to click on those links, it would help out this channel just to check out how people are feeling and preparing ourselves for tomorrow's ceremony. I can't wait for that. I can't wait for you all to leave your lists 10 through 1 down below and why. It's my favorite part of these videos. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned. We have some more Oscar coverage coming to this channel.